and I went to the first summit, which is Jabal Sham summit. I got there, it was hell getting up there. Mm. And as I was walking up there, I was like, why is my body not strong enough? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to the Mo Show. I believe we are at episode 13. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a crazy day um, uh, here at the uh, at the golf course at uh, the Royal Greens at the King Abdullah Economic City in Saudi Arabia. Uh, just double checking that we are actually episode 13 indeed. Um, I have uh, I have a Saudi marathon runner here today as my uh, guest this evening. Um, he does part-time adventure excursions in various areas across the Middle East and uh, and Africa. Actually, climb Kilimanjaro. He'll get to that himself. Um, please welcome Faisal at Dorsey. Welcome, Faisal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I always have to ask this question just because the uh, the industry or this advertising medium is very new to the region. Is this your first podcast, Faisal? Um, you know, this is my first official really high tech podcast. Yes. Okay. Uh, like the cameras, like <laughs> when the mic is just next to you, that's it. Uh, it gets a bit intimidating. Uh, yeah. So, no, yeah. but it doesn't bite. It's, it's uh, actually it's friendly. It's actually yes. I feel like you know this is the first <laughs> official. Feel like you're on the radio. The Mo Show is the first <laughs> official podcast I'm in. Fantastic, guys. <laughs> fantastic. How have you been, man? How's your year unfolded uh, amongst all the chaos that we've seen? Well, uh, honestly speaking, I had the most spectacular year ever. Amazing. Uh, I'm one of those people that actually had to still go to work, even though because I'm um, actually working for Saudi Aramco as a chemical engineer. Okay. So at the refinery, we never stop pumping, you know. And because you never stop pumping, you still need employees there. So... Actually, you know, I just didn't go to work for a month, which is March. Mm -hmm. And then starting April, I just did my, you know, normal duties. Yeah. So I, I was kind of part of the outside world. And also the best thing is that there's this thing that kind of disappeared in our lives. It's called the fear of missing out. Yeah. And the thing is, once it disappeared from a lot of people's lives, it disappeared from my life as well. So, so true. <laughs> So basically, you know, I had a lot of good times, you know, spending it uh, at home. Uh, we just moved to a new house. Mabruk, and mabruk. Thank you. And uh, in Bilkhobar? Uh, Damam. Damam. So basically, it's in uh, next to the beach. Okay. Very nice. And the best thing about it is that basically when we moved, we were actually still doing some, you know, refurnishing mm. and, you know, termim, matermim, muswarib. Yeah. What happened here is that all these workers had to leave, right? Mm hmm so I actually, you know, had to work with my brother, my father, and actually complete some uh, duties at home being an engineer. Yeah. So that was what, fun. What were some of the things that you were doing as an engineer around the house? Well, you know, we had this kitchen that had a whole ceiling required. Okay. So, yeah, we had to do the whole ceiling from the beginning. Um, so it was just, you know, just uh, taking the measures, mm -hmm. making it uh, out of aluminum, you know, it was complete engineering. So had a good time. It was two weeks of just work with my brother and uh, my uh, father. And we enjoyed That's it. That's pretty cool that it's all done in-house. You guys didn't have to get a team of, uh, you know, uh, c c contractors to do the work. Uh, it was COVID. Ah, mm -hmm. so none of them could come do the work for you. So it's, yeah, COVID, COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, um, the best thing that happened is that even with COVID, it proved to me that I'm an engineer. Mm -hmm. I can do this. Yeah. Of course. It's not just I need to think. No, I can actually work. Yeah. So um, some of us actually, you know, had that life where basically we thought we're engineers, so we don't have to have a hand dirty. But, you know, getting your hand dirty actually makes you really, really enjoy the job yeah. of being an engineer. So what's uh, what's your day job like? Are you behind the desk uh, under some very comfortable AC or, you know, and you're on an oil rig? Well, um, you want now or... Uh, when did you start at Aramco? Uh, four years ago. Okay, so first year, how, how was that? First year I was in the desk mm -hmm. for six months and then I was in the uh, R&D, which is research and development for a year. And then back to the desk. And then for the past two years and a half, I was in the refinery, so not a desk. Which one do you prefer? Not the desk. Not the desk. <laughs> <laughs> being on your feet. Yes. Yeah. Well, since you're a runner, yeah. I mean, I would imagine that you do prefer being on your feet. Do on your feet. Do you uh, do you get an opportunity to run while uh, in Chirgia? How many kilometers are you clocking a day? Um, during winter, I clock to thirteen to fourteen kilometers a day. Okay. 
summer you can't actually push yourself then uh, if you push yourself you just lose a lot of minerals okay so it was uh, up to five to seven kilometers a day um so summer is all about maintaining people mm -hmm. you know you need to maintain that run yeah uh this is the the, the negative side of living in the middle east uh if you're anywhere in the world you can just sustain you know you build up that run and then you keep going building and building and building but for us we have a limited time so it's september all the way to april mm -hmm. and that's the time when everybody's out yeah. and the weather's nice yeah. and i want to run and all that type of thing but during summer people tend to hide and run on treadmills i don't like to run on a treadmill i mean would you run outside uh, in, in in the middle of july 6 a.m what what time would you go i would actually run um after work so it's 5 30. okay 5 30 6. is it tolerable because in in Shergia it gets uh, it gets as hot as dubai i lived there for five years i mean you guys see 50 plus we don't see it here in Jeddah. Well, uh, sure, yani, uh, we get to 50 plus, but it's not the heat that kills you. It's the humidity. The humidity. You so guys get humidity? Yes, back, yes, back here? totally, totally. Okay. And uh, because of the humidity, it kind of, you know, makes you, it makes you run uncomfortable. But, you know, I also believe that human beings are the most adaptable creatures in this world. They are. And if you can adapt to the humidity. Yeah. You can run through it like yeah. a piece of I cake. I could imagine. I can imagine. And Speaking of a piece of cake, um, I've got uh, a couple of people watching you on Instagram live, and, and I think they're wondering if you're going to eat that uh, Nutella cake that's sitting right in front of you. Well, I'm con I'm contradicting myself. Am I going to go for the Nutella or that box of chocolate there? Because that lo that looks good, <laughs> man. <That> lo <laughs> I'm if just looking at it, and I'm like, you know, is that what's inside if there? If you guys are wondering <laughs> what it is, it's uh, the chocolate and love. It's uh, organic chocolate. There's four flavors in here. It's incredible. Well, uh, which we're going to get to for sure. Uh, but right now, the, the, the question, the, the matter in question is, are you going to have that Nutella? What is it? What is it called? It's like a Nutella with an Arabic twist. Um, it's phenomenal. I had one 10 minutes ago, and now the world wants to know, are you going to eat it or not? It's so good, by the way. I'll tell you something about myself, yeah? Okay. Uh, one of the things that I do is run. Okay. And a lot of people ask me, why do you run? Uh, I'm not a guy that's so fit here. I run to eat. You run to eat. So, so you burn so that you can afford to eat what you will then burn. Yes. So basically, every day I actually do a lot of running mm -hmm. just to... Have that. Who is he going to go for? <laughs> Please have a bite. Yeah. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Mm. Mm. Okay, without the noises, let me put your microphone off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so good. How, how good is that? That is so good. I'm okay. Uh, so, to the uh, 17 viewers watching, um, mm. any questions for Mr. Faisal al here you ha Here you have it, Saudi marathon runner eating a Nutella spring roll, I think is the best way I can describe it. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, please. Thank you. Wow. I never thought in, in my life that on an episode of, of, the, of the Mo Show would I see someone eating a Nutella spring roll, but you live to see and uh, <laughs> breathe another day. <laughs> <laughs> and when he's quite finished, we can get into the next topic. Uh, you said, okay, so you eat to, to run. Um, and, and you've done a fair share of, of marathons. You said you've done four or five marathons so far, mm -hmm. 42 kilometers each. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, at, at any point, I'm going, I'm, this is pleasurable. Guys, I, I told you, I told you. Mm. Are, are you um, like, if you have a marathon coming up, uh, how soon before that are you, are you preparing, uh, you know, tr training and all for, for, for that marathon? Okay, Mohammed. So basically, when it's a marathon, you need at least six months of training. Six months. Mm. The reason why is because basically you need to condition your whole body into actually running that marathon. Okay. It's not like you can jump into it, you know. Yeah. A lot of people do that; they get injured. Mm -hmm. That's why basically you need. I, I I take it. I what I do is I do a six months PB. I call it mm -hmm. every year from September. I start running again. Okay. PB personal best. Yes. Okay. So basically, you like how I knew that? Mm. <laughs> is it written somewhere? I uh, know this is straight from the mind. Okay. <laughs> so basically, uh, start September and then basically, uh, I would actually try to hit my PB around March, April. Okay. That would give me the perfect condition to actually run. I would so I would do a, a ten kilometer run, and I would do basically um, a 15, 21, and then thirty five, forty two. 
and also in between you need to do a lot of racing okay because racing helps you develop yourself faster mm -hmm. a lot of people think i don't race i don't like to compete against people yeah it's not about the competition guys it's just about you com competing against yourself okay so i had a coach one time and he told me Faisal, do you know that one race can actually spare you the the uh, tiredness of running five times okay uh, or, or two weeks of running uh, or training mm -hmm. so basically once you do that race your body would go wow, through yeah muscle yeah. memory and yes, all that yes exactly okay. so you're training six months before uh yeah wow that's a lot that's a long time it's beautiful what yeah. are you talking about i i just thought that it, it, i didn't think it, it's i didn't think it's six months i thought it's two two or three months of intensive uh but i mean it, it is 42 kilometers uh, it's, it's possible you can do it yeah but the thing is you're not going to really be your best okay so i uh, you know i know people that have a two months program of, of doing a 42 kilometers nike has it yeah you know you can just go to nike and they they have the schedule of two months of you training for a marathon yes it will prepare you but you wouldn't be able to come out of it without no injury yeah okay yeah so it, these things take time of course yeah. injury is another element of it you know you don't want to rush body into your you training you yeah. don't want to push yeah. your body i, I uh, had my first injury ever alhamdulillah yani like i'll knock on wood but um at last year i tore my meniscus Ooh. when i was uh, it was actually quite a silly one like i was at a shop with my son and uh he wanted something from a lower shelf and i got into a squat position because he wanted something on, on a lower shelf and i shifted my weight in a squat position and i heard a sound that will forever stay with me yeah yeah like that like <laughs> pop crack and all that so i was like oh my god was that my knee <laughs> and um and and uh i was like okay i have no idea if it is but let me slowly stand up and that will tell me everything i need to know like as i got to 90 degrees i was like yeah that was me that, that was, was me. me and at full stretch i look at it <laughs> you know? yeah it, it wasn't funny at the time <laughs> <laughs> Literally picked him up, limped to the edge of the road. We were in London, like dove into a taxi, <laughs> lied down five minutes to the house. And the thing was like three times the size of my right knee. Wow, wow. Wow. People told me don't do surgery. Um, a cousin of mine, Mishal, uh, he is yani, miskin. He's had all the knee surgeries that, you know, some anyone can put up with. He's had a few and ankles and all that. He said, you want to leave it for uh, like a, 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 a last option. You know, it's the last thing you do. True, true. Uh, when you have no more cards to play, you know, that's your card. That's but true. It's been a year and a half of, of rehab uh, and I'm at maybe 75%. Uh, now comes the big question. <clears throat> Mo, what are you going to do now about it? What are you going to do about it now? Yeah. You know, like, uh, are you going to go back to training? It's getting better. Okay. So, so long as it's getting better, I'm going to leave it. You know what's funny? I can do three, four K, you know, I'm not, I'm not a runner like you. I can do three or four K on the treadmill. No problem. Played tennis a month ago with a bit of lateral movement. It, it made me a week. I was out of doing anything. That lateral movement was detrimental for its, uh, okay. for its healing. Okay. It's crazy. But on the, on, on the treadmill, I went three, four, five, five clicks. No problem. No problem. Huh? But the lateral movement, I realized it didn't like it. And I think it's up to us to know and listen to our bodies and see what it is that it likes and it doesn't like. So the lateral didn't like. So I just paused tennis for now. And maybe I can get into it in a little bit. But I'm going to try to avoid the surgery. Uh, because um, A, I don't want a keyhole surgery going to my knee. And, and B, if there's a way that I can avoid it, I will. I think I agree with you. You know, when it comes to surgery, it's the last resort for anybody to actually go through. Um, physical therapy is good. Uh, trying to basically push through it, sometimes it's good. Yep. But to actually go there and open it up and just cut things up, it's not a good idea no, at all. No, 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 no. You know, our bodies are meant to heal itself by itself. Yeah. So don't push yourself into actually going through a surgery thinking it's a shortcut. It's not a shortcut. We'll come back later and haunt so, you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll remember those words next time I think about. Physical. God forbid doing, yeah, well, yeah, next time I think about wanting to do the surgery because I don't have any more patience. I'm like, that's it. I just want to feel good. <laughs> but, you know, that might not be the case. Yeah. Um, there's a whole adventure side to you. Uh, you told me about uh, the adventures in, in the mountains of Oman. You told me about Kilimanjaro. What prompted that and when did you start doing all of that? So um, everything started just after I came back from Japan. Um, I used to study there. And uh, after I came back from Japan, I actually lived outside of the kingdom since uh, 2006. Okay. So I came back around 2015. And once I came back, I actually was searching for something, you know, something that I didn't know 
if it exists or not. And uh, one of zo- those things that actually I felt so uh, close to was the outdoors. I love the outdoors. And one of my friends actually came one day while after a run and she was like, why don't you come to Jebel Shems? At that moment, I was like, what is Jebel Shems? Oman, yeah? Yeah. And I was like, what is Jebel Shems? And then she's like, it's a trip. It's a community. We just go and do these adventures. And I was like, okay, let me go and try it out. So I go there and basically I actually ended up, you know, signing up for that company, working as a part-time guide for that company. And it just opened a huge door for me because I went, I went and I went to the first summit, which is Jebel Shem summit. I got there. It was hell getting up there. Mm. And as I was walking up there, I was like, why is my body not strong enough? You know, and it's because of my lifestyle, uh, the way I used to live. The things I used to do, I wasn't a runner at that time. I yeah. just started to actually go into running. And the thing is... Um, One uh, too many Albeq sessions? Uh, Albeq. <laughs> well, I w- is that in the East Coast yet? Did you guys get it? Tawa, Tawa, yeah, okay. just arrived. All the best. You know, every day, every day you go see there, you see this huge line there, you know. <laughs> so you kind of cancel not eating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our famous fried chicken here in Saudi Arabia puts KFC to shame. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> So basically, yes, um, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a quick one. That was a brilliant one. <laughs> so that, um, so going up the mountain, you know, I came back and I was like, you know what? I need to change. I need to push myself. And I started going there once every single month. Okay. I would take one day, one, 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 one day of leave. Mm-hmm. And then I would go up to the mountains. Mm-hmm. Soon after that, they asked me to volunteer as a guide. Soon after that, they asked me to guide. And it just worked out. Amazing. And, Fantastic. I'm um, still a part of that community. It's the Hosak community in the Middle East now. We just opened uh, a big branch in uh, basically Al Ula. So operation is going to happen from there in Saudi Arabia and in Masqat, UAE and Kuwait, of course. Awesome. Are you going to make it out to Al Ula at some point? Yes. That was a nice advertisement for Hosak people. <laughs> if, if you're listening. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Kilimanjaro, um, I've heard mixed reviews on it. I spoke to someone that said it was uh, quite easy, strolled in the park, and someone else said it was uh, very difficult and treacherous. Uh, how did you interpret sure. the experience? Uh, I went to Kilimanjaro uh, with a group of five people. Mm-hmm. I never, f- I will never forget those people. Uh, one's uh, basically Ahmed al-Rabh, Saud al-Dosri, uh, Hussein Fouad and uh, Aladdin Amudi, they're my best friends. You want to know why? Because once we actually reached that mountain and walked together, we were a family. We, uh, the thing is, it's not the mountain that's difficult, it's the company. You need to actually really work with those people to actually make it to the summit. You, know, you need to push these people. They'll because push you back. And yes, yeah. exactly. And the thing is, yes, it's hard. And especially if you don't take Diamox, people take Diamox before you go to Kilimanjaro. What's that? Diamox is the pill you take uh, to uh, help you with the acclimatization. Okay. Okay. Acclimatization. Acclimatization. Yeah. Yeah. We decided all of us not to take it. And okay. you can't take it while you're actually on the mountain. Uh. So you end up taking a lot of painkillers. Okay. So the thing is, we challenge ourselves not to take it. Yes, it was hard. The nausea, not being able to eat. Um, getting tired really quickly, uh, waking up early in the morning when it's really cold, but it was worth it. And the reason why is because when I actually reached that summit, I saw a lot of people at that post, you know, wanting to take a picture. And Highest I, point in Africa. Yeah. And the thing is, when I saw that, I just didn't want to take a picture there. How I come? took a, I took a picture somewhere else. Okay. Like I, I saw the post, people lining up for it, and I just went to the other side, and I was like, can you take a picture for me here? And then I just took a picture, and uh, you I know. I like that. That's different. Yeah, and when, when, we, when we were going down, I was fully not conscious. Mm. Because once you go up, you're kind of yeah. conscious. You but don't remember? You blacked out? I was just running down the mountain. Wow. What do you got to do? Run down, run down run down that's yeah. all i remember yeah. you'd see a crazy guy just running down the mountain just to reach the camp that we were staying mm-hmm. at um but you know after i made it 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 actually made me feel like nothing is impossible uh no mountain can take you down yeah. and it kind of opened another world of adventure 
thank you COVID for not making me summit the other mountains this year but you know <laughs> were you planning to yes i was planning with my friends to go to elbrus the yeah. second russia um and every year would do a mountain that was the decision mm-hmm. we made but you know i guess um maybe next year yeah inshallah 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 21 will be different to this year Yeah, I bet you cli- did you climb any mountains I haven't before? climbed anything. Climbed the the, the mountain to uh, marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say how about Najd. I I have not. Um Kilimanjaro is interesting. It's intriguing. I'd like to say that I'd like to do it one day, but you need to. getting out there and just planning all that logistically, will I? I don't know. Do I want to? Yes. Maybe I reach out to you, you know. Um I'll help you out. I honestly, have, yeah. yeah. I'll go with you if you want. Wallahi, that, my, that's where my mm-hmm. mind was It's going. Like, Please come with me. Let's yeah, do it. <laughs> I mean, since you're a guide and, you know, you're an adventurer, an adventurer and a mountaineer. You'll feel safer, Mo? I'd, ra- I'd like to do it with someone who I already know. You know, I don't want to meet someone new there. There's too many <laughs> moving parts. Let's talk about that more yeah, no uh, at problem. the end of this podcast. Plus, we'll take Uthman with us. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He can tee off yeah, from the top. Um, what was it like living in Japan? You said you lived there for seven years. Yeah. So but before going to Japan, I was living in Malaysia. My dad had a... Kuala? Uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur, mm-hmm. yeah. So my dad had a really uh, life, uh, out international life. Okay. So we lived outside a lot. What did, what did he... Was he also part of the Aramco family? Yes. Okay. That's why I'm a brat. Yeah. <laughs> can't believe I said that. I can't believe, yeah, no, We're not going to edit that out. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tesla. <laughs> so great. <laughs> uh, Kuala. Uh, yeah, so Kuala Lumpur <coughs> for two years. And then after that, my friends from uh, CBC program, which is oh. the basically college continuation program that the company Aramco has, they came to Malaysia and they were like, Faisal, come to Japan, come to Japan. I wasn't planning to go to Japan. I was going to Houston, Texas, or, you know, Monash University in Australia, which is basically more relatively close to mm-hmm. our culture. Uh, meaning, you know, we usually go there to study. It's yeah. easier yeah. because it's English, you Bye know. Man. And then two weeks after that, I'm in Japan. Uh-huh. Uh, and when I arrived there, it was spontaneous. But I spent seven years there and I don't regret a second. Wow. Because basically I got to know a beautiful culture. I learned their secrets. I learned how to speak their language. And basically it taught me a lot about my personality It changed the way I see things, the way I think, mm-hmm. and oh, uh, 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 the way I think. And the best thing about it is is that sometimes it's better for you to see the world from a different point of view. Uh, Japan's culture is amazing. Uh, they have a lot of things. They love to be honest. That's why I'm always honest. Mm-hmm. And uh, they don't have any hidden agendas. Um, They're straight, straight up. Straight up. Uh, so if. Anybody would ask me, would you send your daughter one day to study there? I'd be like, yeah, it's safe there. You know, nobody's going to harm you because, yeah. you know, you're a foreigner there. So they would actually want you to be there, spend more money. But, you know, the thing is, it's safe. Mm. Unless you want to, you know, trouble in their, you know, uh, darkest, you know, places. And then you would have to be careful because the Yakuza are not to mess with. Yeah. Uh, did I say Yakuza? You did. Okay. It's okay, man. It's the most show. <laughs> Don't put this on me. <laughs> um, you said you learned a lot from them. Uh, I, I can imagine. I, I adore that culture. I think uh, uh, they lead uh, by example. Um, I think if more countries were like Japan, the world would be a better place. Mm. There's so much we can learn from them. I feel like they, they're healthy. I love the way they... They eat with chopsticks. You know, you eat less, you eat slower. I love how they don't touch each other. They just bow. They've been doing that for hundreds of years. I, I don't know. They just get it. You know, they're respectful. They're hardworking, maybe too hardworking. Mm-hmm. So clean. It's always so like you uh, pictures I see. I went to Tokyo a long time ago, but it's yeah, right. It's Very clean. super clean because basically, you know, something I notice about us here in the Middle East. And th- listen, this is not an episode to compare between two countries. No, no, no. no. You know, like I love my culture mm-hmm. and we have something that they don't which is basically we are bonded by a lot of people yeah. around us. Yeah. So Community. there's no, no suicide rate here. Yeah. Not a big one. You they're, know. they're big. They're, there's a, the figures of suicide there are high. Yes. And the reason why is because basically they're not attached to anything. Okay. You know, and sometimes when they get attached to something and it leaves them, they feel like they, they're not worth living. 
So the thing is, when it comes to us, we are attached to everything. Yeah. If we don't have a family, we have a religion. If yeah. we don't have a religion, we have a purpose. So basically, our culture is very strong. Yeah. Uh, so that's why, you know, Hayek, Shab Saudi. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the thing I loved about them is that, you know, they're committed about how and when to do their job. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't complain a lot to a lot of people. They keep themselves. Yeah. They keep it to themselves. Yeah. And the thing is that when they tell you they can do it, they can do it. They can do it. Yeah. They don't say, "Well, uh, we can do it," and then suddenly they discover they can't yeah. do it. Yeah. So it's them saying either they can or they cannot. Yeah. They're uh, efficient. Yeah. I heard a story that when when uh, the earthquake hit, I think it was 2011, the big one. Yeah, I was there. You, you were there. Yeah. You were there. I was sitting there. Was it ten points? It was a bit nine. Oh, nine. Nine. Nine yeah. point one. Yeah. Um, wait, you were there when it happened? Uh, no, I was on a holiday. You weren't in Japan. My house was there. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me there, right? <laughs> it didn't come with you on holiday. <laughs> um, uh, so I heard a story that when when the earthquake hit, and uh, you know, obviously it it, it uh, rumbled and trembled for for a couple of uh, seconds, whatever, forty, fifty seconds. And then when it stopped, all right, instead of chaos and looting and people stealing. People falling in line, people knowing where to go. Putting stuff back on the shelves yes. to exit the building because it's not safe. And, you yes. know, let's exit until further notice, until we're told more instructions. People put stacked stuff back on the shelves and, uh, yeah, and maybe, maybe not so calm, but like they left without looting or stealing or pocketing. I'm sorry, but the other 99% of the world countries... We'll take I advantage. don't know if they would have put stuff back on shelves, you yes. know, and uh, I say that uh, quite confidently. The, le- the world can, can learn a lot from Japan. I've been I, wanting I, to go there for a while. I haven't been in 20 years. So that's another trip we can go together? After. Let's do that before Kilimanjaro. Before or after? Before, before. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> I want to do the fun thing first. <laughs> well, Japan is fun. <laughs> yeah. A lot yeah. of karaoke. No, no, no. Yeah, I heard. Um, man, what a place. Yeah. Uh, there's a compared to Hong, you lived in Hong Kong as well, you said, yeah? Yeah, I lived in Hong Kong. My family lived there. So basically, I was kind of in transit between yeah. Japan and Hong Kong. That's more British, you know, influenced, colonized. Yes. It's not like as uh, as thoroughbred or you don't feel the, the far eastness in Hong Kong as you would in Japan. Yes, that's true. Yeah. True. They're kind of strong, even in their opinions. You know, they, they, they're they strong opinion people. Um, I like Hong Kong because it's not as clean as Japan, but, you know, the people there are outgoing, yeah. kind of, you know. Cosmopolitan. You have yeah. a bit of, yeah. You know, finance, yeah. money. Um, coming back to the region here, into you left, you said, in 2006, and you came back in 2015. 15. Yeah. Uh, when you left in 2006... I Came back 2016, I think. 16? Yeah, there's a gap. So there. there's about 10 years. No, there's a gap. Gap year? Yeah. Amazing. Oh, you did? Yes. Did you go with Athman? No. I actually What did you do for your gap year? I was still in Japan. Ah, I you graduated you 2015, and then I had a gap year of doing a master course with Waseda University mm-hmm. and also working as uh, at Aramco Japan office no for internship. Way. While I was doing that, that was the first time first glimpse of me getting into the adventure world I had a Kawasaki Ninja motorcycle that's crazy and I'd had my tent 1000 no no I got a 400 pretty easy okay that's all you need in life yeah but it's actually one of the top 100 it's uh, like there's only 100 pieces of it okay. because it's a special made oh, in Japan collectors edition. yeah still have it yeah brought it with me no way. still can't use it because it's a collective okay good <laughs> leave it in the living room next to the grand piano <laughs> i leave it outside <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is i actually had that gap year where i went around japan and driving my motorcycle camping anywhere um going to unsens and taking a shower there and you know with two of my russian friends beautiful awesome Beautiful traveling, you know. Yeah, that nothing like that, huh? Tra- yeah. Seeing the world, like being exposed to new cultures, getting to learn new things, trying new food. Eating a lot of ice cream. Eating a lot of ice cream. <laughs> yeah, I went to this uh, Hokkaido, it's the northest part of Japan. And in the summer, when you go there, they have ice cream in every stop. Mm-hmm. And every stop has a different flavor depending on the surrounding uh, environment. So okay. some people would grow strawberries here. So you'd find ice cream with strawberry. Hina tut, hina bortakal, hina medrushu. And you just stop there eat the ice cream yeah. then go to the next one stop there <laughs> eat ice cream with, with with trying to do some running in between i would uh, imagine uh, no it was only a motorcycle no running. <laughs> <laughs> 
but um, I guess you know that's something about Japan that taught me something is that you know they really try to uh, help the local market mm -hmm. with whatever they can um, they don't try to export from some somewhere else no it's local market before the export yeah so if they have it here they won't export it from outside okay that's how you grow their cities awesome. uh, that's why it's on the street you know yeah. Yeah, so when you left here in 2006, health and fitness wasn't so big to, you know, the populace of Saudi Arabia and perhaps the region. Now you look around and I don't know about Shergiya, but I would imagine it's like here. There's a fitness time in every corner. There's a gold gym in every corner. There is the startup gym, you know, in every other neighborhood. Did you notice, I mean, the last 10 years, how much that space just took off? It's crazy. You're talking four years, not, not even 10. Four years. Yes. That's four years. That's like... When I was in Japan in 2016, when I started running, I remember I was running in Tokyo. And the thing that made me love running is I was running around Tokyo, seeing different parts of Tokyo, doing a 5K every Sunday in a different area. The graffiti, the architecture, all that type of thing. I enjoyed seeing, mm -hmm. taking pictures, you know. When I came back to Saudi, I wanted to do the same thing in the mom. Yeah, that's not the same, man. <laughs> you know, running through the mom sug. You yeah. know, and basically trying not to get hit by a car yeah, yeah. at something, you know, <laughs> going to Sugan Barkia for Kuwait and running around Sugan Barkia, mm -hmm. having an old guy. I was like, I want to see the city. You know, the world is so big. I need to run through it so yeah, I can yeah, actually yeah, see it. That was yeah. the. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, we were not so big into actually seeing people running in the street. Mm -hmm. Uh, I even have a friend, a friend that actually started running in the street, and he wanted to do the barefoot thing. The cops actually got him, oh and my God. put him in, put him in cuffs, and told him that basically, <laughs> you know, you're running barefoot, yeah. and uh, you're probably running from something that you've done. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any person that used to run on the street is someone who did something naughty. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, uh. and the thing is, what I loved about it is that you know when I see where we were and i see where we are right now mm. i open my home uh, my house's door mm. and just go and look at the beach and i see cyclists i yeah. see runners i see females running all over and it makes me so Beauty, happy as thing. an as an athlete you know it makes me happy because i am so happy that this country is shifting a little bit and not worrying about going to the doctor but you know really doing that thing that actually prevents a lot of people from going to that doctor yeah. we spent a lot of money on the medical my god yes uh, you know we thought pills are the solutions pills are never the solutions mm. that's just an excuse yeah. to actually you know <laughs> plaster yeah. yes but the thing is, you know, once you see people walking, running, you see a lot of people investing more money into, you know, programs that make people make more steps. You, mm -hmm. I've worked to this uh, program called Move to Game during the COVID. We reached around 150,000 subscribers just getting people to walk. Wow. One of them was my father. Amazing. He could have not walked to, to uh, 2,000 steps because he, he just likes to sit down. But the thing is, now not even 10,000 steps can stop him. And my dad is not young. But the thing is, it moved him. And that's what we need. Love we it. need more of these things to actually make people move so we don't have to worry about going yeah. to the doctor. Yeah. I love you, doctors. I really do. <laughs> but the thing is, you know and we know that the best solution to actually get a better healthy uh, community is to have more of these programs yeah being active yes yeah something you you just said there that uh, reminded me of something you said that you know a lot of us go to the doctors and we spend a lot of time at the doctors and money at the doctors um when i'm when i was in london uh last year um i was doing physio for my knee and it was on harley street um 80 percent of the people on harley street which is the famous street in london for doctors were of arab um demographics wow yeah yeah um, we, as uh, a culture, Arabs, we spend a lot on uh, on medical, and um, and that bothers me. You know, like I didn't see as many Brits on that street. You know, one street over on Oxford Street, you see, you see everyone, mm. but on Harley Street, which is the the, the street known for for medicine and, and doctors, uh, the majority of the people on that street are Arabs. Sukkar, mm. marada sukkar, you know, uh, cholesterol. And, um, you know, the diabetes is an issue here. It's, yeah. it's just, it bothers me. And, um, and, you know, maybe one of the reasons is because 
the weather in our country doesn't help, but, but, but that's a bad excuse. We don't go out as much. Vitamin D is a problem. You know, um, the, uh, the English spend a lot more time on their feet outdoors. You yes. know, everyone walks. We don't have that lifestyle. Like when, you know, if I, you know, when I go to the UK from time to time, um, after the first day, because I love walking, after the first day, I'm like, oh, God, that was like a hell of a day of walking. That's because <laughs> I've been in Saudi for, you know, eight months. Minal <laughs> house. <laughs> you know, yeah, minal bait, al-siyara, siyara, al-maktab, al-maktab. And we don't do any walking. Like, I think I clocked 1,000 steps on an average day here. That's a joke. Yeah. In London, I clock, I push for 20,000 a day. Wow. Yeah, no, I really push for it. Like, on a had the nafsi. And it actually happens. Yeah, yeah. It's one step at a time. For sure. <laughs> for, for sure. Um, and I just encourage people to, uh, to, you know, use the car less, even in the cooler months when we can, aff- when, you know, when it's not too hot to walk. And put a target, you know, 5,000 steps a day. You know, pacer on the iPhone. Just follow that that's what we used and it worked yeah yeah. i think ten thousand is the is the daily target for every person it is ten i think you know we i'm just i'm referencing this program is because we target to actually have computer heads people that enjoy computer Mm because كانت هي من SFA and safest which is basically two اتحادات مختلفة اللي هي اتحاد الرياضة الجميع واتحاد اللي هو الرياضات الذهنية الإلكترونية they had an issue with COVID people didn't move in their houses mm-hmm. because they're COVID yeah. so they wanted to find a way where we get more steps more active yeah. so they have I love that initiative yeah and yeah. the thing is what we did is we actually target to have only 5,000 steps a day okay and then people just that's the minimum yeah. minimum yeah. you get 5,000 you clock it during the week you get a prize okay and it's financial prize all right that's how you move so them so it's linked on an app and then everyone yes, contributes yes, yes. like a you can actually sign up right community now. online yeah. yeah okay and the thing is what we did is basically it's amazing because it actually made people move from 5000 now people are actually making 20000 because they got used to the 5000 i love it and you just challenge them yeah. more and more <laughs> and more and more of, um, I think you know having more of these things actually make people yeah, more activist yeah, nice. Yeah, know? getting people involved and all that. Tracking. I yeah. think we have a problem with tracking. Yeah. We don't track our progress as 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 apps. No, no. And the thing is, everything you know, if we have the right tracking system to anything, our health, our education, our um, professionalism, then basically we would be a better community. We will. We would, and we will, and we and we really ought to uh, take it seriously. Yeah, that's um, true. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I bet you even the life expectancy in our region is lower than it's the more active uh, countries. 73. 73? Mm-hmm. Yani, let's compare ourselves to the healthiest. I would imagine the Scandinavians. Uh, and the Norwegian. I think the healthiest is around 84. 84? So Look at that. That's nine years. Average. You know, not including those that, that go to like 95, 96. Yes. The, the Japanese go, they, they, oh. they, age, uh, they age well, mashallah. If they yeah. don't suicide themselves. <laughs> God, um, it's funny how it comes full circle, you know, back to Japan we go. Yeah. Um, um, what's next for you, man? Like, what are your Um So basically, um, there's one thing I, want, I actually wanted to bring up that was important. Um, I'll get back to it. But yep. uh, just to say next is I'm actually working with a group of talented people to start up this uh, bouldering and rock climbing gym in Shargiya. And the thing is, it's a challenge that we're actually putting for ourselves because it's a very high um, capex. But the thing is, we don't know if we have that market niche where people will come and rock climb. But, you know, sometimes if you do these things, you might create something that's much better, like a bigger adventure hub or something like that. So, yeah, rock climbing and bouldering gym in Shargi are coming soon this March, inshallah. That's so cool. And um, we are trying to push to have it as a family place. Mm-hmm. The thing is in Saudi, we have this kind of, well, and one of the things that you, you have to choose either it's a male or female. Well, you know, my sport is neither male or female. My sport is targeted for the young people and you can't have kids in, in, yeah. in, in those gyms, you know? So that kind of hurts us because I want my kid to actually try rock climbing when he was like five or six. I want my kid to actually, you know, challenge himself going up yeah. You know, a wall, you know, uh, it makes a difference for him. Mm-hmm. One day and another, one step and another. I saw this video of a baby going up a wall and him hesitating on one step and then coming back and going up again. And then suddenly you see him going up and that one step led him to another 10. It's amazing. Challenging himself. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's only a baby. So for me, this is important. And I hope that, you know, we have that 
um, you know. That's nice. I like that initiative. Yeah, Best of luck. Very good. And once you open it and it's uh, up and running, yeah. come out west because we do have a decent rock climbing uh, community here in Jeddah. A lot of people go to Taif every other weekend. Yes. A um, uh, um, good friend of mine, Rayan Ghalayini, he's uh, one of the Taif faithful. He goes out every two or three weeks. Uh, he's really big into rock climbing. He owns a gym in Jeddah. And whenever he gets the opportunity, he goes out there rock climbing. And he says it's his happy place. Amazing. He really, really enjoys mm. it when he's out there. Um, I actually tried Tanuma. Tanuma. He's uh, it's funny you say that because he g- he goes there every other month. Yeah, I go, What's I, it? It's is it is it a rock climbing haven? Is that why he amazing, goes? Amazing, man. Okay. Amazing yeah. place. You know, you just go there, you find those camping grounds, um, and basically you find uh, two routes for climbing. You find that community that you talked about, and it's just a beautiful place to go. Yeah, Tanuma's yeah. nice. Um, actually, speaking about the rock climbing community, I think. Uh, in two uh, around 27th uh, and 28th of this November? Uh, November, they're having a competition in Jeddah. Rock climbing. Yes, there's no a way. rock climbing. T- I'm, I'm commentating. Where? No way. Yes. yes. Top, can you tell my friend uh, Rayan whereabouts this is going to be and uh, um, if he can take part? Um, how about he texts me and maybe I, c- I will give him your number. Yeah, uh, I I don't know. I'm from Shergia. Okay, he's <laughs> trying to get out of it. Yeah, but it is happening. <laughs> it's happening. Ten days uh, time. Okay. Yeah, so 27, 28, I think. I'll have him reach out in Jeddah. Huh? In Jeddah, it's a awesome. school. I think that's what I heard. Okay. There's a school there that has a wall. They're doing a competition there. Fantastic. But yeah, Hello. that's something nice. You know, we're actually competing on, on walls. There. Definitely. But that's next, I guess. Um, probably you know work harder in Aramco. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, because I'm still a chemical engineer you know? yeah. It's not I'm still I will always be a chemical engineer <laughs> Just in case they're watching uh, <laughs> I hope they are <laughs> And I love my job <laughs> Disclaimer um, uh, So uh, marathons coming up uh, I know we had one in Jeddah earlier this year Was it this year or the end of last year? Are you going to take part in any upcoming marathons in the region? Honestly, uh, recently I've actually stopped from doing marathons. I'm, I'm actually moving into ultra marathons, which is basically yeah, well uh, above uh, 42 kilometers. Okay. And it's more of the outdoor part of marathons. Yeah. Um, I'm, I think I'm doing one around January this year and yeah. uh, next year. Um, there's uh, also one this November as well happening in Hijaz. Mm-hmm. Uh, might hit that one as well, you know. And the thing is, you know, for me, ultra marathon is me, nature, and running. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not a person that's up for competing. I compete against myself. Self, yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, that's breaking a co- co- breaking your PBs every time. That's the code of the day. Yeah. Compete against yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I so, like that. So yeah, I guess that's what's happening with the marathons. Uh, speaking about adventures, I told you Al Ula. Mm-hmm. Uh, we set up there so I think uh, the guys are already up there you know trying to discover you know locations that haven't been discovered yeah, yet yeah. So, so we'll see what we can that do that place there. is a gem man, man. I, it's, I think it's my uh, outside of the two holy mosques I think it's my favorite region in Saudi Arabia yeah, Al-Ula. I know I know uh, I, I I can't wait to go there. I'm going there after, or maybe this week. So I, cool. I'm on a holiday. You are. <laughs> yeah. Live it up. Yeah. Do you have a son? Uh, no. Not married. Not married? Single. When you do have a son, inshallah, or a daughter, what advice are you going to give them if they want to get into the running slash adventure world? There's no advice. I'm just going to take them for a run. And then have them fall in love with it? I've seen it happen to a lot of kids. Nice. Uh, it's sometimes maybe this is the quality time that they can... I look there a lot, right? No, no, uh, me. I wanted to <coughs> clear my throat. <laughs> yeah. So basically, um, uh, I think... <laughs> Uh, for me, I think um, I believe that you know you can actually choose to spend a quality time with your kids. Uh, I would rather have my active time as that quality time with them. Running gives me that opportunity. I've seen a lot of kids uh, in my com- in the Ramco compound uh, with their fathers for the past four years. I call him the champion mm-hmm. because basically he just mimics his dad every single time, yeah. and now he's even faster than his dad. So the thing is that I see him running, you know, and I I think, you know, you can walk with your kid. Just use that hour, man. I think um, uh, the best piece of advice I can give anybody uh, is basically you have 24 24 hours a day. Just take one hour of that 24 hours and give it to your body. Uh, You either can walk, run, jog, exercise, hike, yoga. Your body will thank you at 60. It will thank you today. Uh, it doesn't hurt. Well said. Yeah. So yeah. the thing is, that's my piece of advice. And I think 
if you would ask me what's the thing that inspires me is I believe that we inspire to be inspired. Mm-hmm. So the more we inspire people, yeah. the more we are inspired ourselves. Yeah, very well put. Thanks, Habibi, for your time, Faisal. Um, I really enjoyed your talk uh, and, and listening to everything that you were involved in. Uh, I love the adventure part. <laughs> uh, the running part, maybe not so much. <laughs> but uh, I love how traveled you are. You've, you know, you've been exposed to so many different cultures uh, and societies and countries around the world. And that's uh, yani it's, it's showing from the way you carry yourself and you know, the stories you're sharing. Um, anything you want to close with? Any uh, anything you want to say before we wrap up the day here? Um, the thank you, Mo, for having me. Yeah, you know, my um, sometimes I don't know why people put me in front of a mic. <laughs> well, I know you speak well. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, but I think you know, really, I'm so happy that I met you here. Uh, you're an inspiration, man. Uh, you're the to be, you know, you know that guy. I don't want to say his name. <laughs> <laughs> so Habibi, man, thank you. You're, so you're, you're, you're speaking my praises fight far too high. <laughs> so good luck it, and uh, hope that we can do that. Kilimanjaro and Japan. Too. And Japan, but Japan first. <laughs> I thought you said Kilimanjaro. I want to do the fun part first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then I'll do <laughs> the work. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having Thanks me. Thanks for man. your time. Really thank appreciate you. it. All the best. Thanks. Bye-bye.